Welcome back, everyone. This is The Change Log, and I'm your host, Adam Stachowiak. This is episode 209, and today, Jared and I have an awesome show for you. We talked to GitHub and Google about this new collaboration they have. We talked to Arvon Smith from GitHub, Felipe Hoffa from Google, and Will Kern from Google. We talked about Google BigQuery, the big picture behind Google Cloud's push to host public data sets for BigQuery as the usable front end. We talked about the collaboration between Google and GitHub to host GitHub's public data set, adding querying capabilities to GitHub's data that's never been possible before. We have three sponsors today, TopTal, Linode, our cloud server of choice, and Fullstack Fest. Our first sponsor of the show is our friends at TopTal, the best place to work as a freelance software developer. If you're freelancing right now and you're looking for ways to work with top clients, work on things that are challenging you, interesting to you, technologies you want to use, TopTal is definitely the place for you. Top companies rely upon TopTal freelancers every single day for their most mission critical projects. And at TopTal, you'll be part of a worldwide community of engineers and designers. They have a huge Slack community, very much like family. You'll be able to travel, blog on the TopTal engineering blog and design blog, apply for open source grants. Head to TopTal.com to learn more. That's T-O-P-T-A-L.com to learn more. Or email me, Adam at ChangeLaw.com, if you prefer a more personal introduction to our friends at TopTal. And now, on to the show. All right, we're back. We got a fun show here. I mean, Jerry, we got some backstory to tell a little bit to kind of tee this up. So yep. back in episode 144, we talked to Ilya Gorick. Huge friend of the show. I mean, we've had Ilya on the show, I think, three times now. Is that right? I think that's right. In fact, we we're going to have him on this show as well. We have three awesome guests, and we figured we let them take the spotlight since uh, they've been highly involved in this project as, as well as Ilya. Right. So we got GitHub and Google coming together, Google Cloud specifically, along with a Google BigQuery. Fun announcement around data sets around GitHub, opening those up, BigQuery. And we, we use BigQuery actually as sort of a byproduct of previous work from Ilya, which was GitHub Archive. And that's right. we worked with him to take over the email that was coming from that. And now we call that changelog nightly. So that's that's kind of interesting. Yeah, in fact, we had a we had a, a brief hiccup in, in the transition, but one that we were happy to work around as yeah. uh, what they've been doing behind the scenes is making GitHub Archive and the, the Google BigQuery access to GitHub lots more interesting. And we're going to hear all about that. Absolutely. So without further ado, we've got Felipe Hoffa, Arvon Smith, and Will Curran. Uh, Felipe and, and Will are from Google, and Arvon, as you may know, is, is from GitHub. So, fellows, welcome to the show. Hi. Thanks for having me. Hello there. Nice to be here. So I guess maybe just for voices' sake and for the listeners' sake, since we have three additional people on the show, it's always difficult to sort of navigate voices. Let's take turns and intro you guys. I got you from top to bottom, Felipe, Arvon, Will. So we'll go in that order. So... Felipe, kind of give us a brief rundown of who you are and what you do at Google. Uh, hello there. I'm Felipe Hoffa. I'm a developer advocate, specifically for Google Cloud. And I do a lot of big data and a lot with BigQuery. And Arvon, how about you, bud? Yep. So my name is Arvon Smith, uh, and I am uh, GitHub's program manager for open source data. So it's my job to um, think about ways in which we can be sort of more proactive about uh, uh, releasing data products to the world. Um, and this is what we're going to talk about today is a perfect example of that. Awesome. And Will, how about you? Yeah. Hi there. This is Will Curran. I'm a program manager for Google Cloud Platform, and I'm specifically uh, working on the cloud partner engineering team. So my role is in the big data space and storage space to help us do product integrations with uh, different partners and organizations. Now, the main point of this show here in particular is, is obviously touching back on how we're using GitHub Archive, but then also how you two are coming together to make public data sets around GitHub available, collecting these data sets, showing them off. I'm assuming a lot of new API changes about, around BigQuery. Who wants to help us share the story of what BigQuery is, catch us up on the idea of it, hosting data sets? What's happening here? What's this announcement about? So we can start with what are we doing with GitHub or what is BigQuery? Let's start with the big picture, BigQuery, public data sets, Will. This is a big initiative of yours at Google. Um, GitHub, one of those public data sets, but give us the big context of, of what you all are up to with, the, with these public data sets. It started with uh, Felipe 
uh, he's been working for a while now with the community and different organizations to publish a variety of public data sets. And we've got a lot of great feedback from both users and data providers. And one of the things they've said is that, you know, they want more support for public data sets um, in terms of resourcing and attention so that they can, uh, uh, you know, get more um, support for not just hosting those data sets, but for maintaining them, which is our biggest challenge right now. And so we developed a formal program at Google Cloud Platform to uh, launch a set of data sets that Felipe had been working on them for a while. Uh, and we launched those at GCP Next earlier this year. And so the program basically provides funds for data providers to host their data on Google Cloud, uh, as well as the resources to maintain those data sets over time so that there's uh, current data. And so the program allows us to host a much uh, larger a number of data sets and, and bigger data sets. And currently we're focused on growing the available structured data sets uh, for BigQuery, uh, but then we'll start adding more binary data sets to Google Cloud Storage. As an example, like Landsat data would be a, a binary data set that we're looking to onboard. And, um, and then that brings us to this week's announcement around our GitHub collaboration. I would love to highlight uh, this about BigQuery. Like we can find open data all over the internet. That is awesome. But what's special about data shared on BigQuery is that anyone can go and immediately analyze it. Like mm -hmm. everywhere else, you have to start by downloading this data or by using certain APIs that restrict what you can do. Uh, when people share data on BigQuery, like for example, the GitHub archive that Ilya has been sharing for all this time, uh, this data is available for immediate querying by anyone, and you can query it in any way you want. You can basically run a full table of scans that run in seconds without you having to wait hours or days to download and analyze the data at your home. Kind of reminds me of uh, the Martian when the guy's like, hey, I need to do a, a big analysis on the trajectory of the orbits and stuff like that. If anybody's seen the Martian, he's like, I need supercomputer access. It seems kind of like supercomputer access to any data set if, if that's what you want. Exactly. Once we have a data set in BigQuery, anyone, like you, you just need to log in. Everyone has a, fr a free terabyte every month to query, has access to basically a supercomputer that able, uh, able to analyze terabytes of data in seconds just for you. I know one of the things that, uh, and Jared, you can back up on this with uh, piggybacking off of Ilya's work with get up archive and now change all nightlies that that email you know that wouldn't be possible without bigquery because those those uh you know those queries happen so fast it takes so much effort on a computer's part to to get those queries on that big data set i mean that's that's pretty interesting i like that oh yeah so uh Ilya was the one that started sharing data on bigquery like uh, as I, he told you in episode 144 right um he was collecting all these files. He was extracting from GitHub all the logs. And Git BigQuery was opening up as a product at the time. So he chose BigQuery to share this data set. And since then, we've shared a lot more data sets in BigQuery. All the New York City taxi trips, uh, Reddit comments, hacker news, etc. And you're able to analyze it. And mm. now what we're doing with Will is uh, grow this into a formal program to get more data, to share more data, to make it uh, more awesome for everyone. So those are interesting uh, data sets. Will, maybe give us a, a few more interesting ones. Specifically, that would be you know cool for uh, developers and hackers to look at and perhaps build things with. Either ones that you guys have currently opened up since our last show, which was February 2015, quite a bit ago, or things that you're hoping to open up um, that would be interesting for developers. Uh, one of the ones I like using myself is the NOAA GSOD data. I have a lot of interest around uh, climate change themes and topics. And what I found interesting with that data set, and, and Felipe had done some, some great documentation on how to, uh, how to actually leverage uh, that data, is you can go right in there and instantly get, uh, you know, in a matter of seconds, um, the coldest temperatures recorded over time that they've been tracking it back since like, I think it was uh, 1920s. Um, and the hottest ones. And immediately you can, you can see the trends that everybody's talking about where, you know, the past decade or so, yeah, we've hit a lot of record temperatures um, that have not been seen in previous decades. So it's kind of exciting just to be able to like mm. pick up a data set like that and, and validate a lot of the, 
the science and news that you're reading, right? That is interesting. So, well, I guess what I was going to say, how do you go ahead and get started with that? But maybe we'll save that for near the end of the conversation once uh, everybody's appetites are sufficiently whetted. Let's talk about uh, the subject at hand, which is this new GitHub data. So we've had since Ilya set up GitHub Archive back in the day, we've had some GitHub data, um, which was specifically around the events history um, and issue comments and whatnot. But y'all have been working hard behind the scenes, both Google and GitHub together, um, to make it a lot more useful. So maybe Arvon, let's let's hear from you the the big news that you guys are happy to announce today. So yeah, as you as you kind of will be well aware with the existing GitHub Archive, you know the GitHub API, API spews out all these events like hundreds and hundreds per second of public public like records of things happening on GitHub. So things like when people push code, when people star a repo when you know orgs are created all these kind of things already happen and these are just json kind of blobs that come out of the of the api and so you know the github archive has been collecting those for about for about five years now um so but what we're adding to that is uh the actual content that these events describe so you know if, if you had a push event in the past uh so somebody pushing code up to github you you had to go back to the GitHub API to go and get the file, for example, um, you know, the, a copy of what was actually changed. Um, and so what we're actually adding to, uh, to BigQuery is a few more tables, but these tables are really, really big. Um, so for every, so we've got a table full of commits. So every commit uh, now has the full message that people were, you know, uh, uh, for, the, for the author, uh, the files modified, the files uh, removed, all the information about the commit and and the source repo and then so that's about 145 million rows uh, it's probably more now it's probably upwards of over 150 million um we've got another table which has all the file content so you know all of these projects uh on github that have an open source license you know you the the, the license allows us to you know third parties to take a copy of this code and go off and and, and you know do things with it that's what's kind of one of the great things about about open source so there's now a copy of these files in in BigQuery tables, and so this is this is the big one. This is about three terabytes of uh, raw data that has the full file contents um, mm. of the of the object that was touched uh, in the in the repository on GitHub. And I'm sure we'll dive into like some of the possibilities of what you can do with that. And then in addition, there's uh, another another um, table which basically has a full mapping of where the file or all of the files at kind of Git at head, uh, Git head in um, uh, in the, in the repository. So like a mapping of all the files and all their paths, and ma- joining them to the file content. So you can and there's about two billion of those file paths. So basically, we've got this kind of vast uh, kind of network of files, commits, and now also the contents of those files. Uh, sitting ready to ready to query in, in BigQuery, so it's uh, mm. it's about I think it, we're upwards of about three terabyte uh, data set here, and it's uh, the biggest data release that we've ever that we've ever made. That's awesome. It sounds like a lot of work. I'm just sitting here thinking, man, it's a lot of work even describing it. I'm sure both sides have put a lot of effort in this. Can you describe the the partnership, the way you've worked together, uh, the two companies, and and from your perspective, like what all went into making this happen? Sure. So I'll start, but I'm sure there's more detail to come from uh, from Felipe as well on this. Um, so uh, uh, sort of unsung hero of today's call is, uh, well, two really, uh, Ilya, of course, but a guy called Sean Pierce, who works in the open source office at Google. And so, um, you know, like the desire for data from GitHub is like a, a, a generally kind of uh, a general request we get from large companies who are doing a lot of open source. So we get that from, uh, you know, Google regularly pulling data to analyze their own open source projects on GitHub. And so Sean had actually done some um, early work exploring this, pulling these commits into into BigQuery. He'd, uh, he'd started to kind of build out a pipeline to help monitor their own open source projects. Um, but we have pretty good uh, regular uh, conversations with um, with uh, uh, him and uh, the team he's in. And so I think it just came up in one kind of conversation back in February he was like, hey, by the way, I've been working on this thing. Like we have this public data set program that's, you know, growing and this would make a great 
data set um, to have available uh, in BigQuery? What do you think? And uh, yeah, we jumped at the chance to, you know, to, to get involved. And so it's been a few months uh, in development to, you know, to make sure that we're getting, uh, you know, pipelines are all working, but uh, that most of the the kind of lion's share of the work is, has been done by uh, by Sean on the data pipeline, which I think uh, runs every week to update this. But Felipe, could you can you remind us if that's the case? Yes, uh, as, as, uh, well, at least today it's set up to run every week. So this snapshot will be updated every week with the latest uh, files of details in GitHub. I have a quick story about the partnership. Uh, when I was first approached with this, uh, in, in it was, it was Sean and I got introduced to Arvon. And one of the first questions I asked when I, uh, talked to a, a data, a data provider about, you know, is this going to be useful or whatever, given the backlog we have is I ask, you know, can you send me a, a sample query, you know, that shows, you know, how this will be useful to users. And one of the first queries that Arvon sent was a uh, number of times, uh, this should never happen. <laughs> And uh, I knew it was going to be fun just working with this data. And I've just run the query, actually, after our last load here. And we're not quite at a million times yet, but we're getting close. What do you mean by that? Shouldn't have happened. That's the number of times uh, in this data set that, that someone has uh, committed um, a comment that says, this should never happen. Ah, gotcha. So it's, is it in the commit message or is it actually in the code comments? In, in the, in the code. code. In the in code, code, yeah. Yeah. It's like the uh, you know, rescuing, rescuing every error you can possibly imagine. This, this, yeah. this will never happen. This should never happen. Once, We're lots almost at a million. Ones. Right, right. And so you're like, yeah, okay. But it is, it is, it's in there. Um, yeah, there was, a, there was a thing on Hacker News a few months ago with this kind of came. Uh, I think somebody demonstrated that. Um, I think they tried to do a, uh, uh, I think they did a, a, a search on the GitHub side, um, just, uh, just on our standard search to say, you know, let's see how many times something should never happen. Now you can do this with kind of looking at, you know, particular <laughs> language types as well, right? And, uh, and segment, do, do much more powerful searches. So that's, that's one of the things that's kind of fun about the data. That's a great use case. And I think what I'm excited about this is, especially getting it out to our audience and to the whole developer community, is all these new opportunities and use cases and things that, you know, we collectively couldn't know previously. And we can start to know by people asking different questions that, you know, I wouldn't have thought of or you wouldn't have thought of. So we're going to take a quick break. But on the other side, what we want to know is like, what all does this open up? Obviously, there's things that we haven't thought of yet. But uh, what's the low hanging fruit that's cool that you can do now? Um, you can ask these questions now and you can get answers that you couldn't previously get. So I'll just tee that up and we get on the other side of the break. We'll talk about it. Linode is our cloud server of choice. Get up and running in seconds with your choice of Linux distro, resources and node location, SSD storage, 40 gigabit network, Intel E5 processors. Use the promo code changelog20 for a $20 credit, two months free. One of the fastest, most efficient SSD cloud servers is what we're building our new CMS on. We love Linode, we think you'll love them too. Again, use the code changelog20 for $20 credit. Head to linode.com slash changelog to get started. All right, we're back with uh, a, quite a crew here talking about big data, Google BigQuery, GitHub, fun stuff. But uh, in the wings, when we take these breaks, we often have side conversations. And it had just occurred to us that everyone on this call is in a unique place. Like, for example, Felipe, you're up in the YouTube studios in New York because you're at a conference up there. And uh, Arvon, you're in a truck outside of a Starbucks in Canada while you're digital nomading with your family in your travel trailer and, and you've got a super fast internet connection and Will, uh, you're, you're where you should be. You're in Seattle in your home <laughs> office there in, in the Google studio there. So, so that's kind of interesting. So Arvon, what's unique about, uh, you know, where you're at right now, I guess. Um, well, it's, it's, um, it's, well, the speed of the internet is the, is remarkable. Uh, I'm in, yeah, as I say, outside Starbucks with about a hundred megabit connection. So that's pretty great. That's unheard of. Uh, yeah, so I can report that the Canadians have better Starbucks Wi-Fi than the Chicagoans, which is where I've lived for the last four years. So um, what else is unique? It's lovely and sunny, but I've only been in Canada for three days, so I have no idea if it's <laughs> regularly sunny here. But uh, it's, yeah, it's really, it's really nice. Yeah. 
And the good thing for us with this scenario for you is that uh, we get to capitalize on a great recording because you sound great. Your internet's oh. doing great. We don't have any, any glitches whatsoever. So thanks, Starbucks, for super fast internet connections in yeah. Canada. Appreciate that's that. Called, that's sponsored by Starbucks. Probably I'll can't say it. that, right? We'll have to reach out to their PR department or their marketing department to <laughs> send them a bill for this show or something like that. But uh, <laughs> on to the more fun stuff, though. So Jared teed this up before we went into the break, but... Big story here. Google BigQuery has been out there. We're aware of it, but now we're able to do more things than we've ever been able to do before. So uh, let's dive into some of these things. What are some things you could do now with this partnership with this new data set being available there, the, the four terabytes or three terabytes of GitHub public data being there? What can you do now that you couldn't do before? The beauty is that anyone can do it. Uh, so it's not just me, but anyone. It's open data. But just having access, uh, being able to see two billion files, uh, to be able to analyze them at the same time, it's really, really awesome. Um, for example, let's say you are the author of a popular open source library. Uh, you can go and find every project that uses it, and not only that they are using it, but how they're using it. So you can go and see exactly uh, what patterns are people using? What are they doing wrong? Where they are getting stuck? And you can base your decisions on actual the actual code that people are writing. Yeah, I think the the um the kind of insight into how software that maybe you maintain is being used, I think, is one of the most powerful ones um, I can think of here. Because you know, for example, say you've got say you're wanting to make a breaking change to your API. Um, actually, I, one of the projects I maintain on behalf of GitHub, the project called Linguist, um, we want to change. Um, we want to change like one of the core methods. Uh, actually, the one that detects the language of the file. We want to change its name, and we want to kind of re rearchitect some of the library. And uh, we know it's a breaking change to the API, and we've had deprecation warnings out for twelve months. But honestly, being able to run a query that sees how many times people are actually using that API method still. Um, helps me as a maintainer understand like the downstream impact of my changes. Um, and currently that's just not, you know, that's just not been possible before. Um, and of course you can't see what's going on in private source code, but you know, a lot of, a lot of this stuff is in, in open source repos as well. So being able to have that kind of to drill down into source code, uh, all of the open source code that's on, on GitHub. And uh, I mean, for me, the other kind of killer feature is like to be able to do this, you want to write a regular expression of some kind, right? And so, you know, being able to run regex across four terabytes of data or three terabytes of data, we should actually figure out what the exact number is. It, it increases daily, of course. Um, but, you know, being able to run a regex against all that data is incredibly powerful um, and something that's just not been possible before. A while back, we had Daniel Stenberg on the show. He's the author of Curl and libcurl of course and we asked him at that time how do you know who your users are how do you how do you speak to your users and ask them things and really he said i have no idea i mean first of all curl's so popular that it like it's kind of like sqlite like the world is his users um but he didn't really know how people were using his library but with something like this like you said it's only the public repos of course we wouldn't we wouldn't want to expose the private repos big data but he can actually just go to BigQuery and look for how many people are including libcurl, right? Linking to it in their open source. And not just that, but he can also, like you said, look at very specific, you know, method signatures or how they're using it. And, and, and he can, he can get insights. Now it's not 100% the truth. Cause like we said, he's got way more users than just open source, but it's at least a proxy for reality. Is that right. fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and there's fun things you can do as well. Like we've, we've, we're sharing some example queries that we've authored as a group, but of course, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, unlimited possibilities here, but you know, you can also, uh, you know, look at, uh, you know, most common emojis used in commit messages and silly stuff like that. But, you know, so there's, there's, there's uh, less serious things you can do as well that would also be, be currently be pretty difficult. Um, um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, have, being able to drill down and, and, uh, and, understand how people are using stuff is extremely, extremely important to many people. Actually, one use case that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, I mean, everyone's interested if people are using their stuff, but some people actually have to report that, right? Because maybe uh, one particular use case that I, I'm very familiar with is like, 
people who've received funding to develop software, so maybe academic researchers who develop code, um, you know, they'll have funding maybe from you know, the National Science Foundation. And the only thing that matters really to the NSF is how many people, like what was the impact of that software? And, you know, it's really hard to answer that question. Like how many people are using your stuff? You can maybe say, oh, well, it's got 400 forks. Now, you know, I would say anything that's been forked 400 times is pretty popular, but that doesn't actually mean it's being used. It's a kind of a weak, weak kind of signal of usage. Uh, whereas an actual, like I can show you, I can give you the URL of every downstream consumer of my software and it's been used by you know 50 different universities or whatever but you know they, they being able to give people the opportunity to actually report usage is interesting and fun for lots of people but actually like mission critical for many people as well and so um you know we we get a lot of requests at github from uh, specifically uh researchers uh, who are trying to demonstrate how much their stuff is being used it's been really hard to service those requests in the past but i think I think we're going to be in a much better position to do that now. Another interesting use case, Felipe, maybe you can speak to this one. Uh, probably exciting both for white hats and black hats alike is an easy way of finding who and what exactly is using code that's vulnerable to attack. Can you speak to that? Yes. So I'm super excited about that. Like security wise, if you are able to fix and find a problem in your source code, that's cool. But if you're able to find the same pattern, the same buggy code or potential uh, vulner vulnerabilities, uh, with BigQuery, you will be able to find it all around uh, GitHub's uh, open source code and just send patches, contact the, the project owners, uh, open an issue. But now you're able to do this. Um, and things get really, really crazy. So the kind of things you can do. Where, like with SQL, uh, with BigQuery, you can write SQL. Uh, SQL is powerful, but you can only do some limited amount of operations. Uh, you can write regular expressions. But with BigQuery, we also open the space up to user-defined functions written in JavaScript. Uh, for example, there is this uh, JavaScript uh, static code analyzer called JS Hint, And I'm running it now inside BigQuery just to analyze other JavaScript code and see, for example, uh, find all, all of the unused variables. Like, you cannot do that with a regular expression. Mm -hmm. uh, if you try to run this in your own computer, it would take hour, uh, days. But with BigQuery, you are able to just actually analyze the flow of the code. Are there are new variables? How are the libraries being used? So, yeah, it gets really crazy. I'm getting now to maybe the boundaries of what we can do with BigQuery, but mm. I'm really looking forward to what people will build up on this. Like, Let's focus on the security aspect once again with regards to uh, the black hats. So a naysayer of this type of uh, available data is that now you have um, a zero day come out or, uh, well, let's just call it, yeah, zero days released. And now this enables, you know, whether it's a script kitty or somebody who's more capable can go out and not just, you know, fuzz the entire internet for vulnerable things, but they can actually know exactly, you know, what line of code in a particular project uh, is taking this input. And so while people can go out and do pull requests, people can also go out and hack each other. Do you have concerns about that? Um, well, I believe in humanity on one side. <laughs> I think there are more good people than bad people. And usually people, when they are attacking, they are more focused on particular projects. Mm -hmm. uh, on the defense side, uh, here we're giving the ability to people that want to make uh, projects stronger. To, we're giving them the ability to identify everywhere where the potential problems are and harden these open source projects. Uh, that's one of the beauties of open source. Yes, it makes problems more visible, but mm -hmm. by making them visible, uh, you have more eyes uh, looking at them. Now, with having all this source code in, visible in BigQuery, we are just making people that 
uh, want to look for problems, we are giving the tool to find them easier uh, in an easier way and fix them. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at it very much like it's a tool. You know, you can use a tool for bad, you can use it for good. And it, if anything, what this does is it, it ups the ante or it speeds up the game, so to speak. And so both sides can use it. Um, you know, I, I would imagine if you think about you, you believing in humanity, the good people, uh, it just takes one person to go out there and write a program that can, you know, use this data set, query BigQuery for a specific uh, string of code and automatically find that across all the repos on GitHub and open a pull request, just notifying them of the vulnerability mm. in yeah. a sec, you know, in, in moments uh, without any user interaction. I think uh, we'll see stuff like that start to pop up, which is, which is pretty exciting. Exactly. Uh, let's say we always tell people we, within open source that more eyes means more secure code. Yeah. And that benefits a lot of open source projects. But if you have a very obscure open source project, maybe no one will look at it. Maybe no one will be looking out for to harden your code. But this gives a lot more people the ability to look into your obscure project because they will be just looking everywhere. Well, just think about it now. Like right now we have not so much no eyeballs, but very little eyeballs because the process to have such knowledge is difficult. Whereas, uh, you know, with this partnership, this data set available in BigQuery and all the good stuff, you know, now people have a much easier way to, to find these insights. And then obviously, you know, knowledge is power. So in this case, it's, you know, I'm on Felipe's side, Jared. I'm, I'm kind of a, uh, I'm not the naysayer, so to speak. You know? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, do it, you know, because I think about like in our, in the show that's going to come out after this, we talked to Peter he Hedenskog uh, of Wikipedia. Um, about sitespeed.io, and we talked a lot about automating reporting of site performance. And this is similar to, to your point, Jared, where you said, you know, could we automate some things where uh, pull requests is automatically opened up? I think about the automation tools that may be able to take place on the security side to say, okay, here's a vulnerability. Mm -hmm. uh, it also opens up another topic I want to bring up, which is not just the GitHub data store, but other data stores or code stores like Bitbucket or GitLab having similar data sets on, on BigQuery and how that might open up uh, insights to all stores and to all the major stores. But long story short, automating those kinds of things mm -hmm. uh, to the open source out there. That's, that's an interesting topic to me. So I was going to say um, one actually, um, if you, a fun experiment is actually don't do this. I'm not recommending this. Uh, but if you commit, <laughs> if you, <laughs> if you commit a, uh, pu a public access token from your GitHub profile, into a public repo, um, you'll get an email from us uh, within a, about a second saying, uh, we disabled that for you because you probably didn't want to do that. Wow. Um, so I think there's actually mm. like scanning and um, making open source more secure is something that, um, that we care a lot about. Um, you know, we think that's, you know, in everybody's interest, we think, you know, software is best when it's, when it's open. And so, you know, but, you know, we've all committed stuff accidentally and had to rewrite history and like you know it's just you know humans are humans and so i think the things that thinking about the things that um you know the tools that we can do to improve tools to help people stay safe and help their applications stay safe i think is really really um really really important and so we do that currently for github tokens but you could imagine you know uh, i should probably uh, uh want the same level of service if i commit uh you know uh, I don't know, an Amazon token or a big, you know, a right. Google Cloud token or a whatever it is, something that exposes me. Um, you, you know, that's a kind of generically interesting uh, area to to work on. And so I think, yeah, I think um, I think more eyes on open source is, I think, showing how data can be used to make people more secure. Um, I think will help. I think this just helps sort of accelerate. Um, the the progress of um, like improvements to things like GitHub by making data more open. One facet of this that we definitely should mention is that the data set that's provided is not real time. And so when we talk about zero days or like code that's currently vulnerable, you do have a lag time um, between when that snapshot is created. Now, 
Previously, you had told us it was two weeks, and now Felipe is telling us it's one week. So apparently, y'all have gotten better at this since we even talked last. 50%. Yeah, so that's <laughs> nice. I'm, I'm curious if there's ever a, a goal to make that a nightly thing, or if, if a week is, is good enough, or what, what your thoughts are on that. Um, I mean, I would love to see, um, you know, I think an obvious thing to do with, you know, d- d- you know big archives of data is, you know, to improve the frequency at which they're they're being refreshed um i would love to see these things get more and more more and more close to live um yeah so i mean i I mean i think it's uh it's um it's how often the job runs i think the job takes about 20 hours to run currently uh so there's gonna we're gonna hit a limit of how quickly the pipeline can run but you know maybe it can be paralyzed further um i don't know felipe felipe do you recall how long it takes to do this big import right now what I can say is things can only get better. Like it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how things just improve while I'm not looking. It's our current, you know, it's our current bottleneck in in data warehousing and analytics. And so, you know, you can expect that all cloud providers are going to be optimizing for that and getting as close to real time as possible. What what does it take? I guess can someone walk us through the process of, you know, capturing the data set. Uh, whether it dumps down to a file, what's the process? Uh, maybe even Arvon on your side, like what inside of GitHub had to change to support this? Like what new software had to be built? Um, but walk us through the process of the data becoming available and then actually moving into BigQuery. What's that process like? Kind of walk us through all the steps. So from GitHub side, actually very little changed. Uh, so and I, I'm not very, I'm probably not the best person to talk to about the process of actually doing the doing the data capture. I mean, uh, we do, we regularly like increase API limits for, uh, for large API customers. Um, and so I think we did that, but Felipe, do you have more detail on this? Yeah. Let me make a parallel with what the story Ilya told you when he was back here, February last year. Mm -hmm. Uh, first he started looking at the GitHub public API. He started logging all of these log messages. And once we, he had these files, he had to find a place, one to store them, to analyze them, and to share them. And the answer was BigQuery. Uh, now in 2016, we had a similar problem, just bigger. Uh, it starts by taking a mirror of GitHub, uh, using their public API, looking at GitHub's change story history. Uh, once you start mirroring this, you have a lot of files. And then the question becomes, uh, where do I store them? Where can I analyze them? Where can I share them with other people? And that's where Sean Pierce is the superstar that writes this pipeline to take one mirror GitHub and then uh, put it inside BigQuery as relational tables. That's basically the, the Google magic in summary. But yeah, it takes a lot of my producers and doing things at Google scale to be able to just Oh, yes, I downloaded it. Uh, I made a mirror of uh, right. all of GitHub. I guess the thing I'm trying to figure out is, is um, what makes it take a week? What, what's the, the latency in terms of capturing to querying inside of BigQuery? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, what's the process to get it there? That's a good, that's a good story there, but why does it take a week? Yeah, no, I, I think it uh, might take closer to a day, but it's all about how many machines you have to do this. Right. Um, you want faster results, you just keep adding machines to it, and then it becomes a question of how much quota do you have inside Google versus other projects. And I hate to keep further compressing the time like we're just making changes right now, but I, I think we're down to six hours. <laughs> really? The, oh, nice. The, the pipeline. Yeah. So we had a conversation a week ago, basically, to tee up this conversation. It was two weeks then. Then we thought it was a week today, and now it's six hours. Well, by the time the show ends, it's going to be real time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good job, Will. <laughs> Felipe is actually coding right now as we talk. So. <laughs> uh, Sean is a star, but hey, it's all about getting more uh, machine resources for the project. And the more people use this data set, the more important it becomes. Well, we start putting more resources on it. I'm yeah. really, really looking forward to what the community will do with this data and the tools they will develop over BigQuery to, to be able to just analyze the data in place. So I have a good example, I think, of a question that's currently 
pretty much impossible to answer without this data set if, if you're interested. Absolutely. Um, so I was talking to um, a researcher about six months ago, and he was trying to answer the question. So like, if, 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 if you kind of read a 101, let's get getting started in open source, like how do you create a successful open source project? People will tell you, it's very important that you have good documentation, right? Like you, you want to have your API documented, you want to have a good readme. Um, and he was like, you know what? I've used software where the documentation is really poor, but it's still really popular. And over time, I've seen the documentation improve. So his question was, is documentation a crucial component of a project becoming successful, becoming widely used? Mm. And uh, so to answer that question, you kind of need you know, a timeline of every commit on the project, you probably want to know the file path, what was in the file. Uh, you know, let's say documentation in GitHub's world is, you know, Markdown, ASCII doc, restructured text, you know, even just those three extensions would probably represent about 95% of, of all documentation. Um, and so you can look at what's code and what's docs, but, but you, you can't do that query today. You have to, as an individual, you would have to go and pull down, you have to git clone, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe, of repos from GitHub, store them locally, then write something that would allow you to, you know, programmatically go through all these git repos, building up these all these histories. Um, these histories are now in BigQuery. Um, so I'm not saying I know exactly how to write that query, but it, the data's there, right? It's possible now to answer this question. And I think one of the most exciting things for me about this data set is, you know, I think there is still a huge amount to be learned about how people build software best together. Um, and I think um, that's not something that necessarily, you know, the, the really hard questions I think are often best answered by people in like the, you know, the computational social sciences, people who study like how people collaborate and they need really, really big data sets to do these studies. And to date, it's just not really realistic for github to you know the api for Git, github's api is just not serve, designed to serve those kinds of requests mm -hmm. it's designed for building applications against and so i think there's i think we're going to see uh you know i think we're going to see a huge huge kind of uptick in the amount of really data intensive research around around uh, about about collaboration and about open source software and about how people you know best work together and powered by this data set yeah, that's, that's very exciting. And as people who are, you know, very much invested in watching the open source community do their thing and tracking it over time, uh, I'm excited at all the possibilities that are going to be opened up. And I even think of just when GitHub Archive came out and all of a sudden we started having cool visualizations and uh, charts and graphs and like people putting answers together that, that we, did, we didn't know we could ask, ask questions about. And now we have so much more super awesome. I think what we're going to tee up for our next section is BigQuery itself, because it does seem like a little bit of a black box from the outside. Like, how do you use it? How do you get started? How long do the queries take? You know, there's a free tier, there's a paid tier. I'd like to unpack that so that everybody who's excited about this new data set uh, can, at the end of the show, go start using it and check it out. So uh, we'll talk about that when we get back. Our friends at Full Stack Fest are putting on a week-long Full Stack Development Conference in Barcelona, September 5th through 9th. The focus of this conference is solving current problems with new and inspiring perspectives. Head to fullstackfest.com to learn more. It's a wide range of topics any Full Stack developer would enjoy. Erlang and Elixir, Reactive Programming, HTTP2, GraphQL, NLP backed bots, Docker, IPFS, distributed file system, serverless architecture, unikernels, Elm architecture, the future of JavaScript, ES6, ES7, CSS4, Relay versus Filecore JS, Angular, CycleJS, CSP channels, handling interplanetary latencies, WebAssembly, mixing React with 3D, virtual reality, and the physical web. It's a full stack fest. Early bird tickets are available until July 15th. That's coming up soon. At the end of that day, they will no longer be available. Speakers from all over the world, from companies like Twitter, Netflix, Microsoft, Erlang, Shopify. And to top it all off, enjoy a week in sunny Barcelona. Tickets, again, are available for the whole week. Only the back end days or only the front end days. So you have your choice to kind of go all week 
or go to back end or front end days. And for our listeners, save 75 euros before tax after July 15th. If you missed this early bird price, use the discount code, the changelog. Once again, head to fullstackfest.com. All right, we are back talking about BigQuery, GitHub, public data sets, all that fun stuff. Felipe, tell us about BigQuery. How do you use it? So BigQuery is a hosted tool by Google Cloud. So you just go to bigquery.cloud.google.com. And basically, it's there open, ready for you to use to analyze any of the open data sets or to put your own data. Uh, just in case you're wondering it's all, if it's only for open data, nope. Uh, you can also load your private data and it's absolutely secure, private, etc. But with open data, you can just land there and start querying. Now, you will probably need to have a Google Cloud account. So if you don't have one, uh, you'll need to follow the process there to create and open your Google Cloud account. But then you will be able to use BigQuery to analyze data and everyone can analyze up to a terabyte every month without needing a credit card or anything. So you can choose which data set to start with. Uh, I create, I wrote a guide about how to query uh, Wikipedia's logs. Those are pretty fun. But in this case, if we want to analyze GitHub, we can go to the GitHub tables um, to find some interesting queries. Well, we have the announcement on the GitHub blog, on the Google Cloud Big Data blog. Uh, we have, I'm writing a Medium post where I'm collecting all of the other articles I'm finding around. So you will want some queries to start with. And then start the questions. The question is, what questions do you want to ask? Mm -hmm. uh, you have this table that Arfon uh, described at the beginning. Uh, one of the most interesting tables is uh, the one with all of the contents of GitHub. So this has all of GitHub open source GitHub files that uh, are less than one mega that are not binary that are less than one megabyte and that table has around 1.7 terabytes of data and that's a lot especially if you're using your free quota if you query that table directly your free quota will be out immediately so thinking of that we created at first a uh, sample table with all that much smaller. Uh, let me check the size right now. I have it with me. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you the exact size in a minute. The thing okay. is you can go to this table and you can run the same queries you would run on the full table, but your uh, what are your allowance, your uh, monthly terabyte will last way more. You can choose to run all your analysis there on the sample and then bring it back to the uh, to the mega table, but it all depends what questions you're asking. Mm -hmm. And I also created, this is outside the main project, but in my, in my, op, in my private space that I'm sharing, I created an extract of all of the JavaScript files, all of the PHP files, Python, Ruby, Java, Go. So if you're interested in analyzing Java code, you might be better off analyze uh, starting from my table. Mm -hmm. And then you can start asking uh, the questions you might have from uh, at least start with one of these sample queries. A couple of things, let me interject here. So uh, all of these uh, things that Felipe is referencing, we will have linked up in the show notes. So if you're listening along and have the show notes there, pop them open, we'll have example queries and all the posts, both from GitHub and Google published around this. Um, so that's probably a good place to go. You mentioned your uh, monthly allotment or your threshold. I can't remember the exact word, but uh, your quota. Yes. Let's talk about that. So BigQuery is free up to a certain point, and then you start paying. And the reason for this example data set, which is smaller, is because if you're just going to run you know, test queries against the whole GitHub repos uh, data set, you're going to hit up against that pretty soon. Can you talk about that? I think there's some... Even as a user, like we have ChangeLog Nightly going and have for, you know, a couple of years now, 
Uh, I don't need, we never gotten charged. So I guess we're inside of our quota, but like, I don't have much of an insight into like what all we're doing. How does the, how does the payment work and the, the quota? Is it based on like how much data you've processed? Exactly. So BigQuery is always on, at least compared to any other tool. You don't need to think about how many CPUs or how much RAM or how mm -hmm. many hours they're running it. It's just on always. And then the way it charges you is by how much data you're querying. So it looks at the tables you're querying, specifically at the columns uh, mm -hmm. you're querying and the size of those columns. And that's basically the price of a query. It's, so if a, if a column is one gig or something like that, or, you know, half a terabyte, then yeah. you're essentially being charged to query at half a terabyte. Exactly. So today the price of a query is $5 per terabyte queried. So if a column is one gigabyte, divide $5 by a thousand, and that's the price of your query, mm. the cost of your query. So assume I'm ready. I got my, I got my question asked. So I have my, I've used the GitHub uh, examples, the data set or the, the subset for my development. And I have a, uh, a query here. In fact, from some of your guys' examples, here's one. Let's say it's the how many times shouldn't it happen one that Will talked about earlier, um, which it appears that this thing pulls from GitHub repos.sample files and GitHub repo, it joins GitHub repos.sample contents. So every time I actually run that in production, it's going to add up the size of those two particular things and then charge me once, you know, per time I hit the big query, is that right? Exactly. Every time you write a query, in fact, mm -hmm. when you write a query, before running it, you can see how much data that query will process. Oh, that's handy. Yeah, because basically it's a static analysis. You have the columns you mentioned from the tables you mentioned, mm -hmm. and then the query knows basically the exact price. I'm just thinking outside the box because you all have AdSense and the way people buy ads uh, that you may actually have a bidding war at some point or not so much a bidding war, but you might be able to have something where I want to query these things several times a month, but I have a budget and uh, I'll query them if it's under this budget and you might be able to do those queries if said budget is not met or is, is exceeded. That seems like something in the near future, especially as we talk about automation around this. Yeah. So the idea here is to make pricing very, very simple. If you're able to know the price of your query before running it, uh, then you can choose to yeah. run it or not. And it's essentially about uh, instead of querying the whole data set, instead of querying the full content stable with that 1.7 terabyte, uh, let's just query all of the Java files. So, and if, some, if I have not created, if someone has not created the extract you need, maybe the best first uh, step on your analysis is extracting the data that you want to analyze. Do you feel like you'll have any pushback at all for, uh, I guess, a higher free threshold for open data sets? Because there's always this, um, this sort of push or this, uh, uh, this angst, I guess, where if you're doing something for the good of open source or something that's free for the world or just analysis that someone is always like, hey, can you make this thing free for open source? And if you're doing, you know, if you're, since we're this show is specifically about this partnership and the GitHub public data set being available, what are your thoughts on the pushback you might get from the listeners who are like, this is awesome. I want to do it. And uh, can I have a higher limit? So at least what makes me pretty happy is that we are able to offer uh, this monthly quota to everyone. Like, it's not, it doesn't stop once, it's not for the first 20, 10 days. You have access to this at least until, I don't know, like every month you will be having this uh, terabyte back to run analysis. And that's pretty cool on one side. And then, well, if you want to consume a lot of resources, uh, at least you're able to instead of having to wait one month, uh, at least you have the freedom to pay for, to have more resources, even more resources available. And just a context set, because I agree, like, you know, in cloud, we're continually getting feedback and then just based on competition to reduce pricing and, 
and make things more optimized and efficient and cost effective. And so just where we were just a moment ago really was uh, without BigQuery is that in order to do analysis on any data set, you would have to go find that data. You'd have to download that data and possibly pay some sort of egress. You'd have to upload it into your own storage on, on, on uh, whatever cloud provider you're using. And there's a cost there. And then you'd have the, the consumption for doing any query on it. So like the, it's a valid question, but right now we've already reduced the cost uh, for public users. And, and I, and I fully expect that, yeah, people will be asking for uh, more higher limits on querying the data. And, and I just expect we'll continue moving and making things uh, cheaper and more efficient for users. Well, I, you know, I think the steps you just mentioned there that, you know, just for one, telling people, you know, this is what it actually takes to do this without BigQuery. And now the BigQuery is here. We've taken so many steps out of the, out of the equation. You've obviously got Google Cloud behind it, the supercomputer that we talked about in, uh, in part one of the show, basically you know, having access to that. And I think just sort of helping the general public who is going to have clear interest in this, especially listen to this show, like everyone who listens to this show is either a developer or is a, you know, aspiring developer. So they're listening to this show with a developer's mind, so to speak. And so they're thinking, yeah, if I want to use this, how can I use it? And, uh, but knowing the steps and knowing the pieces behind the, the scenes to make this all possible yeah. definitely helps, uh, you know, connect the dots for us. And it's really what's great about working at Google is this is really in our core mission. I mean, yeah. you know, Google's core mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally available. And then so for the public data program, you know, this is a natural extension of that mission within the cloud organization. And I, I see these public data sets plus tools like BigQuery is, and, and I know this word gets overused, but it's, you know, democratizing information even further. You know, we've, we've all been these unknowing or, you know, knowing or involuntary collaborators in providing public data. And so I like the idea that we, we all have equal access uh, in these public data programs and, and we're now getting meaningful access to that data. And, and so like today we're doing a better job at making the data, the data available for download, right? It's like cdata.gov, for example, like, mm -hmm. like public data is, is, is pretty, pretty accessible now. And so I think the next step, though, and, and going back to that comment I made about meaningful is, is yeah. to make provide the tools that, that lower that ramp even further and give all these collaborator, collaborators meaningful access. You know, so we're starting with SQL, which, you know, for, a, for most developers and marketers, like, is, is a pretty good level of entry for uh, querying, you know, enormous sets of data. But, you know, I think we're going to end up with, like, machine language powered speech queries, right? where, you know, we're not, Felipe, Arvon, and I aren't talking about these queries that you have to construct and these, uh, and, and managing your limits on the data. You know, we're actually telling you just to ask the machine, the data set, a question. Yeah. Let's continue on the, a little bit on the practical side of how you get that done. So you mentioned the console, the, which is where you can, you know, write your queries and test your queries and run them. Um, there's other ways that you can use BigQuery as well. Once you have those queries, you know, written, for instance, with ChangeLog Nightly, we're not going into the console and running that query every night and shipping off an email. It's all programmatic. So can you tell us uh, what it looks like from the API side, like how you use uh, BigQuery not using the console? Yeah, so BigQuery has a very simple to use REST API for people that want, that want to write code around it. Uh, so now we have a lot of tools that connect to BigQuery. Um, Tableau is one of the big ones. Mode, uh, I, in specifically open data, we are partnership with Looker. So some of our public data sets that we are hosting with Will uh, have a specifically Looker dashboards built over them. Um, I love Redash uh, for writing dashboards. And that, that's a dashboard software that was not created for BigQuery at all. But it was open source. People loved it. Uh, uh, people started sending patches so it connect to BigQuery. So now uh, you can use Redash to analyze BigQuery data. And that's, uh, I just love using that one. Uh, the new Google Cloud, the new Google Data Studio also. Uh, it's a pretty easy way to just create dashboards. Uh, I'm sharing one of these dashboards specifically for GitHub, uh, this GitHub data set too. 
So yeah, you don't need to know SQL. Uh, I just love SQL, but you can connect it to uh, all kinds of tools and also to other uh, platforms like Pandas or R, etc. It's all about once you have a REST API, you can just connect to anything. One last question on this line of conversation. We talked about how long it takes to process, to, to get the data into BigQuery. It was two weeks, then it was a week, and then it was 20 hours. Now it's six hours. Um, how about querying it? And we haven't talked about like, what's it actually, what, what do we expect if we're going to do the GitHub, uh, you know, the full Monty, uh, like this, this quote, or this query for emoji used in commit messages, for instance. Um, however many terabytes that covers, are we talking like, you know, three seconds, 30 seconds, uh, minutes? What, what do we expect? Depends a lot on what you're doing. Uh, here we're really testing the, the boundaries of BigQuery. Like we are going beyond just, uh, if you, you can go way beyond doing just a grep. You can just, I don't know, look at every word in every piece of code, split it, count it, group it, uh, yeah. run regular expression. So some queries will take seconds. I love those. Uh, I love being able to just <laughs> go on a stage and just uh, start with any crazy idea, code it, and have the results while I'm standing out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes there are queries that are more complex that involve joining two huge tables that BigQuery can do these joints. But when reaching the boundaries, it's good to limit how much data you query, for example. Uh, oh, I have this pretty interesting query that might take two minutes. What about if we, uh, just to get very quick results, we sample only 10% of that data or 1% and things start running a lot faster. But it's, it's really cool. So on one hand, you feel that, oh, I'm reaching one of the boundaries. But at the same time, you feel that, wow, I'm really doing a lot here. Uh, let me see if I can run a query now. While we talk, I'll come back when I get my query. Uh, Flippy, maybe you can multitask. I'm not sure, but let's let's uh, let's test you out. Uh, you know, earlier in the show was actually in a break. We talked about some things you you have uh, some affinities for for what the possibilities of uh, BigQuery and all these data sets being available uh, might offer. And one of them you mentioned was being able to cross-examine data sets. So, for example, you had said how weather may affect. I think it might have been, you know, push us to GitHub or push us to open source or something like that. But basically how you're able to capture various large public data sets that may be like traffic patterns, weather, and the ability to, to deploy code or push code to GitHub. But what, what other ideas do you have around and what are some of your dreams for cross-examining data sets? So just to answer the question, because I, I told you I was going to come back with this. There you go. Uh, I copy pasted one of the sample queries. In this case, we are looking at uh, the sample tables with the sample contents. This basically has 30 gigabytes of uh, code. I'm looking only at the Go files in this case, and I'm looking at the most popular imports for Go. Mm -hmm. And basically this query over 30 gigabytes run in five seconds. Not too shabby. <laughs> that, that, that's that, fast. That's, yeah, <laughs> that, that's how cool things get. Uh, yeah, so going back to dreams, uh, just seeing data and BigQuery, just seeing people share data here, um, where's my appetite for how can I join different data sets? Um, for example, something I was running, I ran last year when I got all of Hacker News inside BigQuery, uh, the whole history of comments and posts. Uh, was to see how being mentioned on Hacker News affected the number of stars you got on GitHub. Oh. Yes, I can send you that right. link too. Or you can also have the public data set of the change log and, and when we release new shows, how popular that project might get. Ooh. Exactly. Ooh. We, yes. Oh yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> yeah, so we, we can see all these uh, things moving around the world, the pulse of it, and how each one affects each other, Reddit comments, Hacker News comments, uh, the Wikipedia page views, and you can see the real effect on code on what, what will be happening on GitHub code, or how on the stars, on how things start spreading around, and the ability to link these data sets, uh, to add weather, like, oh, peop do people code under good or bad weather? Right. 
let's extend that a bit then. Um, another question we have for you is, and this is more for all of you, this isn't just you, Felipe, but keying off of this topic here, what would you like the community to do as a result of this? So you have some, you know, pure love for cross-examining data sets, things like that. And as you can hear, there's a crazy storm here in Houston. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you heard that lightning there. The, the hatches are being battened down now. My wife, she's out there taking care of it, but I got to go join her soon. So maybe the show will end eventually. But <laughs> in between now and then, uh, you know, what would you like the community to do? So you got the listening ear of the open source world. Hearing you guys talk about this stuff now, all these data sets being available. Will, maybe at some point you could talk about some other data sets that might come to play here as well to, to fuel this fire. But what are your dreams for this? What do you want the community to do with it? I'll go. Um, so I would love to, I mean, one of my favorite projects that uses GitHub data, uh, get, you know, open source data on, uh, of, from GitHub is, um, is libraries.io. And I know you had Andrew on yeah. uh, yeah, a few episodes ago. So I think there's still, I think, huge opportunity to lower the barrier to entry for people into open source. And so I think part of that is, you know, maybe product changes and improvements to GitHub. But I think there's, um, you know, there's like really interesting projects out there, like first pull request and up for grabs, like uh, low hanging fruit issues that are easy, easy for the community to work on. I think I, I'm convinced that there is in this data set, um, like the answers to questions like what makes, uh, you know, a welcoming project for people to come and work together, you know, combining We've got everything that everybody's ever said to each other. Uh, all of the code that's been written, you can run, you know, s static analysis tools on that code to see how, you know, see, uh, look at the, the sort of, you know, the, the quality of that code, maybe how approachable it is. There is, there's just, I think, a missing piece right now that if I am a, you know, a 20-something CS graduate, and I can program like crazy, but I've never participated in open source. And there's lots of these people. Or maybe I'm just somebody who's just got my first computer and, I, and I've heard about open source and I want to get stuck in. I think there's a, there's a missing piece right now that we are, you know, we're not connecting always the, the sort of supply in terms of the talent that's out in, in the world with the opportunity of projects that have, you know, everyone wants more contributors. Everybody wants people helping to build software with them together. And so I'm really excited to see what the community are going to do around those topics. Because I think, you think about what Andrew's done with libraries, I think that's a really good example yeah. of kind of uh, like stepping, you know, stepping in that direction. But this, this makes r kind of richer, more uh, intelligent kind of uh, uses of that data for, for, for you know, strengthening Strengthening the open source ecosystem is, is where I think the big opportunities are. And I think that's actually, you know, um, you know uh, ideas are free, right? Like there's money to be made doing that. If somebody right. wants to go and like build companies that solve that problem, I think that's a generally interesting problem to solve. Yeah, lots of ideas come to mind for me uh, on that. But on the note of Andrew, I think Andrew is actually, uh, with libraries, he's actually querying GitHub's API directly. So in this case, he can actually... Um, go to BigQuery and get the same data maybe faster. He might have right. to pay a little, bit, a little bit for it, but he may not have to hit rate limits or things like that or just actually have a much richer ability to ask questions of GitHub versus the API. Exactly, yeah. Cool. What about, uh, Felipe, what about on your side or Will on your side, uh, any dreams? Yeah, for me, I like comparing this with the story of Google. Google, for me, is the biggest company built on data. Uh, basically, you need data, tools, ideas. Uh, data for Google was collecting the whole World Wide Web at that moment. Collecting it was not easy, but you also needed the tools to store it, analyze it. And then you needed ideas, like a lot of companies at that time, there were a lot of uh, web search companies that had all this data, had a copy of the web, a mirror of the web inside their servers. But the ideas that Google had of, hey, let's do page rank, let's look at the links between pages to rank our searches. Uh, that was huge. So I, I look at the same, I'm looking at the same right now with this and other data sets. Uh, we have the tooling. Tooling might be BigQuery. Tooling might be, that, that BigQuery gives you the ability to analyze all of this, but you can create tools above this. Uh, I'm looking you know, forward to see more uh, static code analyzers that will run inside BigQuery. 
uh, you need ideas. That's where I'm looking for the world to bring new ideas, new ways to look at this data that we're making available. And I'm looking out for data. I really want people, so we're making a lot of data available in query, and I would love people to share more. And that's why we have Will here also to help to bring, if you have an open data set, if yeah. you want to share data, instead of just leaving a file there for people to download and take hours to download and then analyze on their computer, et cetera. If you share it on BigQuery, then you make it immediately available for, for anyone to analyze and then to join with other data sets. So for me, that's... that's well, since you cute. mentioned Will, Will, let's... Uh... There's definitely one subject I wanted to save closer to the end here, which is talking to you about the data sets that, uh, that you're, I mean, this is mostly around the partnership with GitHub and this data set, but what other data sets as Felipe had mentioned, what, what do you have your eyes on? What hopes do you have there? Yeah. Well, what I'm focused on right now is trying to get data sets that, uh, address that accessibility issue I was telling you about earlier. Um, like a lot of the data.gov stuff, like, uh, Medicare data, census data, um, some of the climate data. And what I find interesting about this is it's, you know, this, de this data has been collected for decades. And so the schemas around this data were designed, mm -hmm. you know, well before we even thought about big data challenges, uh, much less just early, even SQL, you know, it's like pre no SQL challenges. Right. So, um, you know, we're talking prior to the seventies and, so the challenge here is like taking a lot of this data, which is coded, you know, it's truncated because at the time uh, there were limitations on um, uh, characters and everything else. And so is getting all that coded data, which is technically available for download by the public, but not usable. We're planning on uh, onboarding some of the data from the government catalogs, like the census data, uh, health data, Medicare data. Uh, patent data from both uh, U.S. and Europe, um, and then some more of the weather-related data. And uh, it's it's a it's a big challenge because a lot of this data is decades old and was designed at, at a time before you know there was even SQL or big data, and so it's heavily coded. And so the challenge here is to um, decode that data, uh, it, which requires resources, and then structuring in a way. Uh, that it fits well into BigQuery. And then, you know, Felipe can take it from there to the community and, and construct all sorts of interesting queries and, uh, and address that accessibility challenge that I was talking about earlier. Yeah, something that uh, I just told you guys what I was going to close with, but I, I actually want to throw one tiny curveball in here. And it just occurred to me during the show that as we were talking about the, you know, the code insights, so to speak, you know, the, the insights that it comes from being able to have such deep querying into not just, you know, the events, but also the actual code and different files that are, that are going to be stored as part of this. And, uh, there's obviously some motivation on GitHub side to, to do this. So Arvon, feel free to, to, you know, throw a mention here on this, but I'm kind of curious to all three of you, just whoever wants to share something about this, but I'm curious about how this opens the door for other code stores you know, stores forward from back in the day, I think they still are kicking around. I'm not really sure what their status is, but uh, you got Bitbucket, you got GitLab. Obviously, you know, having this kind of insights is kind of interesting. So does this open up the door for other stores? Does this, is this something that's a motivation for everyone to, to do that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I mean, I actually think that, you know, the open source software wherever it is is you know uh, uh, you know hugely valuable um and so i would love to see um more uh, more open source software available in a way you know similar way to the way we're we're releasing this data today um with google so you know i think the more the better as far as i'm concerned you know if we were 10 years ago you know a lot of a lot of open source activity was happening on sourceforge and you know there's still stuff up there that's used and still incredibly important. Um, and of course, you know, people, people are on Bitbucket and GitLab and, and, and other, and other hosts as well. So I would love to see, you know, more, uh, vendors, um, participating in, in archiving efforts like this. Um, I think there's more to be done simply than just depositing data. Um, I think there's also this sort of, you know, we have the way that 
we, our API works. Um, you know, Bitbucket has its API, GitLab has its API. You know, there's 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 differences between all the different platforms, uh, even if maybe there's many of them are using Git or Mercurial at the at the kind of base level for the code. So I think there's actually really big opportunities to standardize some of the ways in which we kind of describe the sort of the data structures that represent not only code, but all of the kind of pieces around it, the community interactions, the yeah. comments, the pull requests, um, all of these things. And so I'm aware of a few community efforts. Um, there's one uh, called uh, 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 Software Heritage. Um, there's one called Flossmol, where they try and they've got, for example, all of RubyGems uh, stuff in there and a whole bunch of SourceForge data. I think, you know, I've talked today about some of the things about, you know, empowering uh, the research community around these data sets. I think one of the one of the issues with doing that right now is, um, you know, I spend most of my time thinking about GitHub, uh, the data that GitHub hosts. But of course, that isn't all of open source. And I think making sure that uh, it's possible for for all of uh, all of software to be studied, I think, is really is uh, is going to be really important going forward. So yeah, I think there's there's and there's a bunch of opportunities there about improving platform interoperability that. Mm-hmm. Kind of, that I that I don't think many people are talking about right now, and I'd love to see sort of you know some advancement in that because I think it's good for the the, the ecosystem at large. Yeah, uh, I would like to highlight also the technical side. There is a big technical problem, and the question here is: Are we able to host all of GitHub code, open source code, in one place and able to analyze it in seconds? Uh, well, we just proved that we can. So. Let's keep bringing data in. Let's keep uh, furthering the limits. But yes, technically, we can solve this problem today. That's a good thing. I mean, obviously, you know, Will, with your help and Felipe, your abilities to to lead this effort and Arvon, your, you know, your efforts on the GitHub side of things to to be open to this. And I think part of this show is, um, one, sharing this announcement, but uh, but two, you know, opening up an invitation, you know, to the developers out there to the people out there that are doing all this awesome open source and dreaming about all this awesome open source, having this invitation to, uh, to uh, bring their company's data sets. If, if there's open data out there to BigQuery, And, uh, and so I guess, well, what's, what's the first step for something like that? You said that that's an open door. Obviously if 10,000 people walk through the door at once, it's not a good thing because you may not be able to handle it all, but what's the process for someone to, to reach out? What's the process to, to share this open data. Yeah, so they can contact us. Um, and I'm trying to pull up just so I get the, it's, it's on the, on the cloud.google.com site under our data set page. Um, they can contact us. Um, where is that email? I will, I will give that email to you so you can, you can put it in awesome. your, uh, your accompanying doc. But also, uh, I would also encourage them to reach out to Felipe uh, on, on Reddit or on the Medium post. Um, and just get, get a hold of either of us that way. We'll have that uh, Medium post in the show notes. So if you've got your app up or whatever, I just, our, our I just got up. it. It's BQ dash public dash data at google.com. BQ dash public dash data at Google. Yes. I would like to add that on the technical side, if tomorrow 10,000 people want to open data sets on BigQuery, that's completely possible. Like anyone can just go and load it in BigQuery and then make it public. Uh, what we're offering with this program is uh, support to have your data set publicized, shown, uh, w- taking care of the paying for the hosting price. But you can just go and do it yourself. Wow. Uh, working with us is much, uh, it's cool, but you don't need to go through a manual process. You can go and do it. That, that's an excellent point. And to be clear, you can upload your data and then put ACLs on it to make it public. And then anybody that queries that data, you're not going to be charged for their queries. Gotcha. That's good then. So you can, you can mainly do it if you have a big data set and you want some extra handholding, so to speak. So email the email you mentioned. We'll also copy that down and put that in the show notes. But it, it's possible to do it on your own, as you'd mentioned, through the, big, uh, the, the BigQuery interface and making it public and not being charged. That's a good thing. Well, let's, uh, let's wrap up. Cause I know I had a storm. We did have a quick break there cause of the storm and my internet outage for about five minutes. So thanks for, thanks for bearing with that and listening audience. You probably didn't even hear it because we do uh, a decent job of editing the show and make things 
making things seamless when it comes to breaks like that. But this is time for some closing thoughts. So I'll open up to everyone, uh, whomever wants to take it, but just some closing thoughts on some general things we talked about here today. Anything else you want to mention to the listening audience about what's, uh, what's happening here? All right, I'll go. <laughs> okay, so I would, I mean, I'm incredibly excited to see this data out uh, uh, in the public. I think we talked a lot today about, um, you know, public data, but, you know, so there's sort of open data, but also useful data, usable data. And I think this is, you know, the first time that you've been able to, you know, query all of GitHub. Uh, and I think that's an, a, a, you know, incredible opportunity for um, studying how people build software, um, you know, understanding, understanding, uh, you know, what it means for projects to be successful. I think, honestly, I think the most exciting thing for me about this is that the data is now available. It's out there. And I think the possibilities are, you know, near limitless. And I, I can't wait to see what the, what the community does with this data set. Well, Philippe, anything to, to add to close? Uh, I would love to add for anyone analyzing data. It doesn't need to be open data. I love open data, but anyone that's analyzing data today that is uh, suffering, taking, waiting for hours to, to get results, uh, having a team managing a cluster, babysitting a cluster overnight, uh, try BigQuery. Like things can be really fast, really simple, and that will open up your time to yeah. do way more awesome things. Awesome. Well, I can definitely say that we've been enjoying BigQuery, but uh, go ahead. Will you add something you want to add? Oh, I just wanted to add to, to what both uh, Arvon and Felipe were saying that uh, around community is what I'm really looking forward to is seeing the community participate in developing interesting queries. Uh, and, and, and I'm sure there are data sets out there that are interesting that I'm not aware of. And I would love to hear about those and try to get those uh, uh, more accessible. One more curveball here just at the end of the show. It occurred to me too during the show, like over the years of the change log, we've, you know, we've had a blog, we've had this podcast, we've got an email, and we've talked several times about open data, public data being open sourced on GitHub. And it, it, it now occurs to me that all of that effort can now be imported either by way of GitHub, but also just directly into BigQuery. And, uh, you know, so if, if you're out there and you've got a, a data set you've open sourced on GitHub, go ahead and go to BigQuery and you know put it there and make it public there. That way people can actually leverage it because I can't even count on my hands how many times we've covered open data in all the ways we've talked about on the show today. But that seems like, you know, putting it on GitHub is great, but then making it useful, not that GitHub isn't useful, but making it useful is putting it on BigQuery and opening it up for everybody. That's, that's to me, seems like the cherry on top. Um, obviously, you know, we, we've got a couple links we're going to add to the show notes. Um, we've got this announcement, obviously, between this partnership and the, the GitHub data set being available in, in this new way. Um, the blog post being out there, we'll link those up. Uh, so check the show notes, listeners, for, for that. But I just want to say thanks to, to the three of you for, one, your efforts uh, in this mission and caring so much. But then, two, working with us to do this podcast and share the details behind this announcement because we're definitely timing this the release of this show uh, for all, all the listeners right around, if not the same day, like the same time frame, like maybe the day after. So I know there's a, been a couple of posts already shared out there, so I'm not sure exactly on perfect timing, but we're aiming for this to be uh, right around the same time. So you know, announcement at, at CodeConf for GitHub, and you know, but we're trying to work together to to go deep on this announcement, share the deeper story here, and obviously get people excited about it. So I want to thank you for working with us on that it's an honor to to uh to work with you guys like this but uh that's really all we wanted to cover today so listeners thank you so much for tuning in check the show notes for all the details we talked about in this show but uh fellas that's it so let's say goodbye all right thanks very much Uh, it's been really fun to talk in depth about the project today so thanks for having me on thank you very much i love being here i love being able to connect to all everyone here at the change log yeah thanks for having me as well it's been a great conversation And with that, thanks listeners. Bye.